Okay, thank, thank you everyone for registering. Uh, welcome to day, today's event, uh, today's webinar, uh, which is about supply chains and the state of the union. Um, my name is Laurie Goodall. I'm an international trade advisor, uh, a customs advisor for the Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce. We are accredited chamber for Berkshire, Buckinghamshire, Oxford, Swindon and Heathrow. Uh, before we start, I would just like to say today's session is being recorded. Um, recording of the session will be available on our website, um, which you can find. Obviously, we'll give you details of that afterwards. Uh, for questions, if you wish to raise any questions, please do so using our, question, uh, our Q and A facility, and we will endeavour to come back to you during the session. Hopefully, um, yeah, otherwise, uh, we would try our best to answer every question uh, following the webinar. So on to the webinar. Um, supply chains have had many challenges over the last few years, including the impact of COVID and Brexit affecting pricing and stability. Traders have endured difficulties with freight costs as well as demand forecasting in a year of inflation. So what is the current state with supply chains? And where are the processes in place for environmental sustainability targets? When looking at supply chain disruptions for those importing and exporting, where are the logistical solutions through the global bottlenecks? To talk about this, I'm going to introduce you in a minute to our expert, Richard Perriman. He's the Vice President uh, for Supply Chain for, for Scan Logistics. Uh, Richard has over 30 years experience within the logistics and freight forwarding industry, having gained experience working for airlines, international freight forwarding and logistics companies, is able to advise companies wishing to upscale, enter new markets and move across international borders. He has worked with many of the world's largest brands and corporations in helping them to re-engineer their their global supply chains and making large savings. Having previously held the position of VP Transatlantic Development and USA Development Manager, working in the US, US extensively over the last 20 years, he is well equipped to support British companies as they seek to explore US market entry. More recently, he was involved in the design and implementation of a global supply chain solution for a major tier one automotive supplier and continues to support companies through Brexit, exploring contingency options and providing risk analysis, which including supporting the Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce, the US Embassy, Department for International Trade during this process. He's also made a few television media and media appearances and as an expert in this area. Today, uh, as well as Richard, um, we are also joined in the background by Rob Matty, who is also Scan Logistics Customs Compliance Manager. So with, all, with that, I'd like to hand you over to Richard. Are we, are we good to go? <laughs> Uh, Richard, you're still on. Richard, you're on mute. <laughs> Hello. Can everybody hear me? Okay, thank you, Laurie, again for the uh, the introduction and for the opportunity to uh, to present today. Uh, as, as, as Laurie mentioned, I'm joined by my colleague, Rob, uh, who is, is the expert who will field all of the difficult questions um, uh, towards the end. Um, I wanted to whiz through, first of all, to give some context as to who Scan Global are. Uh, we're a fairly new name in the UK, albeit the UK company uh, we've been going for 32 years, but we were acquired um, two years ago and rebranded to Scan Global um, in October 21. Um, so Scan Global, we're a, a Danish-owned logistics company, fast-growing, with a turnover last year of 
billion US, three and a half thousand employees and 150 offices around the world. And our, our tagline is to make the world a little, little less complicated for our clients. Richard, do you just want to uh, share your, your side of the presentation? Yeah, I think. That... Just want to share your screen. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so we're at say 150 uh, uh, offices around the world and uh, and fast growing. Um, we deal with all modes of, of logistics and freight forwarding, air and ocean, obviously, rail and, uh, and road freight, all the way through to um, uh, sustainable logistics, which is a, a, a major part of our, our business model. And, and I'll touch upon those later. We work in a, a lot of different verticals. Um, uh, aid and relief is a, is a huge part of, of what we do. We work for the United Nations with the, the preferred logistics partner for them. UNESCO, the World Health Organization, we carried 70% of the COVID vaccines around the world for the, uh, the World Health Organization. So we're, we're, we're pretty trusted. We work with some of the biggest brands in the world. Here in the UK, we have, uh, well, UK and Ireland, we have four offices. Um, recently opened an office in Newcastle, but our headquarters here in the UK is London Heathrow, where I sit. Rob actually is joining us today from Shanghai. So he's em employed by us in the UK, but uh, it, obviously it's a little bit far for him to come every day. So he, he sits in Shanghai. Our site at Heathrow, it's uh, just outside the M25 in Colnebrook, large warehouse with uh, um, uh, full security customs bonded um, with X-ray and trace uh, facilities there for security. And then in Kent, we have a large fulfillment warehouse and home to our ocean freight team. We operate uh, almost like a little mini Amazon there, managing clients, uh, uh, e-commerce sales and storage. So uh, enough of a sales pitch for Scan Global and onto the, the, uh, the topic, which is the state of supply chains uh, globally. Um, any of you that are moving goods by ocean freight out of the Far East will be aware that rates have uh, fluctuated just a little bit uh, pre-pandemic, during pandemic, and now coming out the other side. So rates now um, are very much uh, in tune with what they were pre-pandemic. At one point, the rate for a 40-foot container, uh, I've put it here as $15,000, it, it did actually hit... Uh, as, as much as $18,000 at one point. Um, but as I say, those rates have now come down very quickly and they're now settled. Uh, we've not seen any, uh, any spikes um, and we don't foresee any. So we think that this is probably the, the new normal for a while uh, yet. Then if we look at the uh, USA to Europe, because you can see it was a much flatter increase it did go up uh, quite considerably, but um, uh, it's uh, it's certainly flatter, um, and it's it's come down, uh, and it's probably going to stay around that level, around about twelve hundred dollars for a for a forty foot now uh, from the US East Coast to to the UK. Now the reason for those those spikes. Um, is, primarily the, the, the trade imbalance uh, between China and Europe and the United States and Europe. The, the rates from China to Europe during and after the COVID pandemic uh, can be attributed to various factors, supply and demand dynamics, trade imbalances, operational challenges and, and government interventions. The initial spike from China to Europe during COVID-19 was largely driven by a surge in demand for goods from China, particularly PPI or PPE, I should say, <laughs> and medical supplies. That sudden increase in demand overwhelmed the available shipping capacity, which led to a shortage of containers and, and a subsequent rise in freight rates. The pandemic also interrupted global supply chains, causing logistical challenges such as port congestion, reduced vessel capacity due to blank sailings, which was cancellation of scheduled voyages, longer turnaround times, 
These disruptions increased the costs for shipping lines and freight forwarders, which was then passed on to customers in the form of higher rates. There was also the issue with the Suez Canal being blocked, with, which had major implications to vessel rotations, as it, as it is the only gateway between ourselves and the Far East. Um, that, that caused huge log jams at ports, and I say all the vessels were in the wrong place, which really screwed things up for everyone. The other thing is that China is a major exporter of goods and we're its primary trading partner. So that trade between China and Europe, where China exports a huge amount more than it ever imports, affects the freight rates. During the pandemic, as European countries face lockdowns, um, there was a decline in European exports to China, which then exacerbated the trade imbalance and, and again, the freight rates. But the difference Regarding the difference between the freight rates in China to Europe and China to the US, it's attributed to, to the variation in trade patterns, market dynamics, etc. The, the US is typically more balanced in terms of imports and exports uh, with Europe than, than, than China. We, our, our trade balance uh, with the US is pretty much 50-50. So there was a, a relatively smaller rate increase during the pandemic. Additionally, the US had higher availability of, of capacity um, because the, the demand didn't fluctuate. The, you know, the US didn't make a lot of PPE or, or, uh, or uh, pharmaceuticals at, at, at that point. As, as far as the subsequent drop in rates, it's primarily due to the easing of supply chain disruptions, increased capacity, and the rebalancing of the trade flows back to pre-pandemic uh, levels. And as the economies recovered from the pandemic, um, uh, you know, whilst we've got specific factors such as geopolitical considerations, such as you know the war in Ukraine, etc., um, we, we've seen a, a settling of rates, and we don't see those uh, changing too much in the in the short term. What the steamship lines, however, we 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 met with the CEO of MSC, the largest steamship line in the summer last year, um, and he was predicting that the new normal rate would be around about six thousand dollars. And yet it's down at 1400. So even the CEO of MSC either doesn't know, isn't able to forecast, or he was, he was playing his cards very close to his chest. But what they, they do have as a mechanism, the steamship lines, is, is a blank sailing approach. And, and so if the demand of uh, uh, de demand for space out of China is, is very low, they'll simply cancel a sailing and hold roll over that freight for the following week. What's impacted that even greater is um, the steamship lines before the pandemic all put in orders for massive vessels. The average vessel coming out of China um, uh, over the last decade ran about 10,000 TEU, so 5,000 40 foot containers. Um, the orders now for vessels are around about 20,000, so double the size. But of course, with double the size vessel, but the capacity isn't as great, um, they don't want to run those, those vessels half empty. So uh, uh, as a result, you, you know, you can have a booking, it's secured, and then the shipping line decides we're going to cancel that and it rolls for the following week. So um, to provide some, some context again, with, with these larger vessels, a lot of these steamship lines, they put the orders into the shipbuilders and then said, actually, thanks for building it, but we don't want it anymore. Well, the shipbuilders are now... Uh, using their leverage and, and forcing those those vessels to be released. So um, I can see a bit of a hiccup coming down the line where they either dry dock them uh, and continue with the smaller vessels in, in, in the short term. So we move on to my favorite subject. Um, so Brexit. Uh, it's had huge impacts. Um, it's not been reported as widely as, as uh, um, perhaps it should, but um, I think the the economic repercussions are now being realised. That it, it, you know, the economy, our economy is is not um, uh, working in the way that the rest of the EU uses at the moment, um, and, and yet we all went through the pandemic, and we're all uh, we're all impacted by the Ukraine war. So the main issues are customs and border controls. Exporters are now facing huge customs procedures and border controls when trading with the EU. The requirement of customs declaration, increased documentation, potential delays, uh, and this administrative burden and the border checks. 
do increase lead times, increase costs and disrupt supply chains. So if your European customer is able to source a similar product in, in, in within the EU, uh, there's always the potential that they're going to do that rather than suffer the delays, the inconsistency and, and all the higher costs. The trade barriers, the EU's ex, the um, UK's exit from the EU, whilst it was painted as, well, we've got a free trade deal with them, as most of you will probably know, that free trade deal only applied if the goods were of UK or EU origin. And regrettably, we don't make a lot of, of physical product in the UK. UK. We, we upsell, we, we sell uh, services and, and uh, uh, IP, but physical goods, most of what we export was once imported. So a lot of the uh, free trade um, potential doesn't apply because the goods are not of, of UK origin. Regulatory compliance, well, now we, we still have to uh, uh, adhere to EU regulations um, and compliance and certifications because we want to sell to Europe, but we've also now started to introduce our own set of regulations. Um, so there's two sets of regulations we've got to, to, to keep up. Supply chain disruptions, as, as I touched on, um, uh, increased paperwork, delays at borders, trade relationships, renegotiating terms with your with your suppliers, your, your customers, um, trade agreements. As, as a uh, well, yesterday uh, our trade deal, I think, with Japan went live. Um, we've also got the Australian and New Zealand trade deal, which apparently within ten years will give us. 0.08% uh, uh, benefit on, um, in terms of GDP. Um, so they, they've not come as quickly. There's no, there's no Indian trade deal uh, on the horizon. They've, they've said there will not be. The US have said the same. Um, so the vast majority of deals that we've got in place were rollovers from what we already had with the EU. So one of the, the, the um, major points of discussion I've had with clients since Brexit, and it's still ongoing, is those, those that are selling within Europe um, and fulfilling orders from the UK, uh, it becomes quite problematic. It, it can be very costly, as, a, as I've referred to earlier. So one of the, uh, the solutions potentially can be having... Um, EU fiscal representation, i.e. setting up a, a registration in the EU and holding stock there. So essentially you split your inventory, hold inventory on the mainland that's already pre-cleared, customs, uh, customs cleared, duty and, and tax paid, and then it can be in free circulation anywhere within the EU with no borders at all. Um, it's quite an easy switch on. Uh, the, the, the pros to this are, is, well, market access, establishing fiscal representation, representation allows you to have a local presence uh, and access those EU markets without borders. VAT compliance, um, it means that uh, with local VAT regulations requirements in the EU, um, as an as a EU registered company, that becomes easier. Customer service, you can respond to orders quicker. Uh, without any kind of customs involvement, so your, your customer doesn't uh, have to get involved in, in clearing goods. And it reduces transit times and costs. The cons to it are establishing and maintaining a fiscal representation does involve additional costs, including fees for appointing a representative, administration expenses and, and compliance requirements. Um, and, and of course, you've then got legal and financial responsibility for, a, for a, an entity in Europe. Um, so there are pros and cons. It's not the right answer for everybody, but it is a fairly straightforward process to, to implement. Um, and certainly in, in, in our experience, it's helped a lot of clients that were struggling to fulfill orders to Europe. Um, but it's not the right answer for everybody. Now, in terms of customs, and uh, this is where, where Rob is going to, uh, to hopefully support, um, we do offer customs consultancy, so if clients wanted to explore um, how to enter a new market or look at setting up fiscal representation or just simply look at their, their inbound uh, customs into the UK, uh, myself and Rob are very, very happy to support. Um, there are some new customs initiatives um, 
that are coming down the track that most of you will have uh, be aware of and or heard about. Um, and I, I go back to something, and Malin, uh, who's who's listening in on the call, has, has probably heard me say this about ten times because he was in the audience for most of my my Brexit seminars. In the build up to uh, Brexit, there was um, uh, a story being told by uh, one side of the argument that when uh, when borders were put up, it was okay because technology meant that everything could be tracked and traced and scanned. Um, and he went, uh, and a certain government or ex-government minister, a very tall guy with glasses who was defrosted from the 1950s, um, said, uh, you know, I had a friend who skied from Germany into Switzerland and uh, he wasn't delayed at all. Well, he would have been if he'd been towing a 40-foot trailer full of goods. The queues from Germany to Switzerland, and they've got 22 points of entry into Switzerland from Germany with customs uh, points there. There are still queues at every one of those points, and they've been doing it forever. So to think that we were going to just switch this on and there wouldn't be any disruption uh, was was naive at best. Um, however, um, one of the main sticking points, the Northern Ireland uh, situation, the protocol there, where due to the Good Friday Agreement, we were not allowed to put a physical border between Ireland and, and the Republic, um, was something that I think was perhaps overlooked slightly during the negotiations. And it has been uh, an absolute car crash for UK companies from the mainland uh, very, very restricted in what they could export easily to Northern Ireland, where essentially goods were going into Northern Ireland as, it, as if it was a separate customs territory um, and only then being able to reclaim duties and taxes after the event when it was proven that the goods weren't then going to be forwarded into the Republic. So the uh, recent move by the government um, in terms of uh, coming up with a solution, uh, the Windsor Agreement, is uh, now in the process of being implemented. So I'll go on to a little bit more about that. We'll, we'll head back to these bits here. So essentially, um, vehicles leaving the UK to go into Northern Ireland will either be deemed as going through a green channel or a red channel exactly the same way as you do when you come back through Heathrow from a foreign trip. Um, the uh, government will make all exporters from the UK who are VAT registered, uh, they will give them a trusted trader status. So essentially, they're trusting you to do this and, and, and only go through the green channel if the goods are going to stay in the Northern Ireland. But if you're found to uh, to uh, not be complying and your goods do end up in the Republic uh, and then further on to, into the EU and they went through the Green Channel, then you will have uh, fines and the trusted trader status taken away from you. But essentially, the, the uh, haulage operators will operate a green truck or a red truck. And when you book your, your shipments, you will declare to them whether it is a red shipment, i.e. it's going to go all the way through to the Republic, in which case it goes on a red truck or if it's going to stay in the Northern Ireland, it goes on a green truck. Um, there's a lot of stuff still to be uh, considered, however. So you export something, and it shouldn't even be considered an export, but let's, let's call it an export. You send something to a client in Belfast, and to the best of your knowledge, that client is going to use that, that product, and they're going to keep it within Northern Ireland or sell it within Northern Ireland. But that company decides they're going to ship it onto Republic and there is no border. And it's found that those goods have turned up in the Republic and then they're tracked back to you. Who is liable? Is it you or is it the company in Northern Ireland? And how does the company in Northern Ireland, um, how do you prove that they ever received the goods? So there's all those kind of vagaries still to be considered, but as a model, if it works, then it'll be a huge improvement on where we are right now. So I'm going to go back to um, uh, certain new regulations that are coming in, primarily around animal products, plant products, et cetera, and, and food. Um, so I'm going to ask Rob to chip in a little bit here. I mean, essentially, um, new regulations are being brought in that are going to, to uh, 
um, require uh, existing inspections to be moved to um, border control posts here in the UK. Rob, do you want to elaborate a little bit on, on, on that? Yeah, so um, it will be obviously risk assessed for what you bring in. Um, there is a very high chance you could have goods checked randomly, even if they are on a medium level uh, from 31st of October. So, I mean, why? We, obviously, you'll need to send goods through ports that have um, access to a um, uh, border control point to be able to be physically checked if it happens. Uh, but it'd be something to consider for sure for any any importers. Uh, make sure you know what, where your goods stand in terms of whether they're medium risk. Um, even potentially low risk goods could could be pulled aside and checked um, at a random. So uh, definitely discuss with your forwarder, discuss with the transport companies, and and I would imagine they'll start to um, again look at whether or not they send like red trucks or green trucks. Same sort of thing from Northern Ireland. They'll, they'll almost def definitely have to sort of separate out potential risks. So they wouldn't then therefore potentially put any of those medium risk products with straightforward uh, machine parts or, or no. standard shipments. So I, I can't imagine the, they would. Yeah. The whole trailer would be, yeah. be delayed. Yeah. Got you. Okay. Um, and CDS, uh, most of uh, most of the companies that we deal with now are registered on, on CDS. But uh, in a nutshell, Rob, what, what, what is CDS and, and what does it replace? So we, for, for almost 30 years, I think we had Chief as the main uh, system we all use to access customs and declare goods to customs. Uh, this was a very old, obviously a very old system. Uh, CDS was always planned to be brought in by customs in before Brexit. Um, it was, I think, originally going to come in around about the same sort of time as when the vote came through. But they delayed it until essentially last year um, with free imports. Um, end of September, we were the switch over date from Chief to using uh, CDS. Um, there were some exceptions for certain forwarders if they had customers who were unable to use CDS fully because of some issues with um, the government gateway and, and so forth uh, and getting authorizations with deferment accounts. Um, but primarily we're using it now, I think uh, pretty much 100%. Um, I don't know of many forwarders that still use Chief uh, for imports, but we are still using it for exports uh, until currently the end of October this year, when it will switch over to CDS for exports as well. Right. So as a, an importer currently, Rob, you, for the benefit of the people on the, on the, on the call, um, you don't yet need to be registered with CDS, but it will be mandatory in September, is that? Well, um, it would be absolutely recommended to everybody to get, if you're an importer or an exporter, to become registered with CDS. Just, just get yourself registered. It, it's very simple to do. Um, there'll be a web link. Uh, you just search for um, registering CDS. They'll be, they'll come up through Google or whichever search engine. Um, but just get yourself registered. Um, whether or not you have a deferment account or not, it will give you access to seeing all your imports and exports by anybody. Um, you'll have a dashboard. You should be able to see all the information. So it's definitely worth having for any uh, any imports you do mm -hmm. uh, or exports. Uh, you'll be able to see all that information. Mm -hmm. And it's mandatory. So if 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 you're not on it right now and you you are an importer, you need to be on it. Yeah, I mean, I would recommend you have it. Um, I think if you like for private imports to say, for instance, don't obviously need to have CDS uh, register registration. Um, we can do imports still with as long as you have an URI number, we can use URI number to clear shipments. But if you have a deferment account, you must give us access to CDS in CDS for us to use your account. Uh, any forwarder needs to have access um, authorization to use your deferment account. Otherwise, we, we can't use your deferment account. So it's very, very important. Uh, you have got yourself registered and the process may be slightly longer if you have a deferment account as well. Um, as I said, there were some issues with some importers not being able to fully register with CDS in the beginning uh, and have spent a long time trying to solve that with uh, HMRC. So it's it's well recommended to become registered and of course make sure you have an URA number uh, if you're an importer uh, bringing in goods, uh, whether or not you have um, a VAT number make sure it's also you're registered as well. 
uh, because uh, it's um, where you may have only imported from the EU before while we were in the EU, uh, you may not have needed an EU number because you didn't do any customs processes. But obviously with any imports now from the EU, uh, there is there is customs processes and you have to have an EU number. Cool. Thank you, Rob. Okay, we, we are available, um, myself and Rob, and I know Malin, um, uh, are very well placed to answer any questions on CDS if, if you've got any concerns, and also about the Northern Ireland um, uh, uh, solution as well. Okay, and moving on to ESG, I know a number of people did ask questions about ESG and, and what impact it will have on supply chains. Um, uh, Pre-pandemic, and I, you know, I'm not saying it's pandemic related, but just the timing co coincidence, if if I approached any large corporation um, with a view to, to, to partnering with them, it was very rare that sustainability was ever even raised as a, a topic, even with the big big brands, the big corporations. Occasionally you, you'd have it mentioned, but but very rarely. Now, every single company I speak to of a certain size upwards, if you don't have a robust sustainability policy, um, you you don't get to have a conversation. And, and that gradually will will filter down to all companies through SMEs. Um, all, all companies will will need to start to, to take it seriously. Um, so uh, the considerations for ESG are, are becoming increasingly integral to business operations and decision making. It's going to have a significant impact on supply chains in the future. I mean, some of the effects, sustainability, environmental impact. Supply chains will face increasing pressure to reduce their, their footprint and, and adopt sustainable practices, that include minimizing carbon emissions, promoting renewable energy, optimizing routes, and adopting a circular economy principle. They'll have to assess and improve their performance, uh, their suppliers. So that's scope three, where it won't be necessarily your specific individual footprint directly, but those of your suppliers, which will include your, your logistics partner. So it's no good if, if you have a, a carbon-free environment and, and you yourself have no CO2 uh, emission uh, impact, but your inbound supply chain does. So that's both your suppliers, the products where they're manufactured, and, and your, your logistics partner. Um, ESG will drive a, a greater focus on social responsibility within supply chains. They'll need to, businesses uh, need to ensure ethical sourcing practices, fair labor conditions, respect for human rights, child labor, forced labor, unsafe working conditions. All this transparency and traceability will be uh, essential. Um, and uh, uh, regulations will come down the track where, where this has to be, has to be uh, presented and, and available and transparent. ESG considerations, uh, they require engagement with, with various stakeholders, the suppliers, the customers, employees, investors, communities, collaboration across the supply chain, uh, sustainability initiatives, sharing the best practices between, between you, um, and, and uh, ensuring that, that you're working with, with providers, with suppliers who, who share that same philosophy. Uh, governments and regulatory bodies are increasingly implementing ESG related regulations and, and requirements and supply chains will need to adapt to comply with these regulations, uh, disclosing your ESG metrics, tracking and reporting carbon emissions, ensuring responsible sourcing practices. You'll need to have robust monitoring and reporting systems to, to demonstrate compliance and, and provide transparency. Um, uh, what we're, we're increasingly asked for and what we, we offer to our clients, and I'm sure uh, other, other companies in the um, industry are doing the same, is, is giving our clients a full transparent uh, report on their CO2 footprint for their supply chain, down to the, the fact that it's picked up on a truck uh, 100 miles from Shenzhen, it's then put on a, a, a trunker over to Hong Kong, it gets put onto a container on a vessel, uh, on a truck here delivered to your door every element of that has has a, an impact on co2 and what we as a as a logistics provider are now doing is providing our clients with a full report on their co2 footprint and giving them uh solutions to mitigate and reduce that risk so they they can get certificates to to demonstrate 
um, that, yep, okay, our CO2 footprint was this, but this is what we've done to reduce or offset. And that could be uh, investing in biofuel um, or investing in uh, solar farms in Pakistan or something like that, uh, that gives you credits essentially against your CO2 footprint. But again, it's it's very important that uh, ESG is taken seriously, not not only for for the good of the planet and and, and to, to keep your business uh, uh, running, but reputation and competitive advantage. Embracing ESG practices does enhance a company's reputation, their brand image, and their competitiveness. Consumers, investors, and other stakeholders are pr prioritizing ESG considerations more than ever, as I mentioned before, when making purchasing decisions. So therefore, if you're a company that's looking to, to grow, um, the likelihood is that your customers are going to want to have uh, evidence that you have an ESG policy um, and are mindful of your, your CO2 footprint. So by having that, that, that approach and having that policy and that transparency, you can build a resilient and future-proof supply chain, which aligns with those evolving expectations. As I said earlier, if, if we as a company didn't have a very, very uh, defined ESG policy, then many of our clients would not be interested in, in working with us right now. We ourselves have, have signed up to the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we do advise the United Nations. We have a, a team in Denmark that their whole focus is on, on ESG. And our sustainability reports available, which may be a, uh, give you a steer as to um, uh, how how we've helped other companies and how how you may want to to look to your your logistics partner to to help you going forward. So, I think that's me done. So, Laurie, uh, back to you in the studio. I think Laurie's gone for a coffee. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Just bear with me two seconds. And I'm back again. Yeah, I hadn't been for a coffee, I was listening to that and very, Richard and Rob, thank you very much for that detailed uh, um, information about uh, the current supply chains at the moment. Um, we have a few questions um, that were pre-submitted uh, that I was going to ask you both. Uh, we have Anita from Penwata, Wanta. Uh, how has supply chains changed globally? Elaborate. What are the projections? What are the projections of the field in the in the near future? I'm hoping you can answer. Okay, that. Um, I think what it it has done, what the pandemic has done, uh, Anita, is it's forced companies to review how their supply chain works. Um, I found that more of our clients and prospective clients are open to a conversation now. Um, at, uh, about what their supply chain looks like and, and, and how it can be improved in order to mitigate the effect or impact if something like this, you know, COVID was to happen again. Um, so they're future proofing their supply chains in a way that they didn't before, where simply they, they did things the same way and they would change freight forwarders perhaps because another freight forward would come along with a, uh, a slightly cheaper rate. Um, uh, an example of, of that would be uh, a client that we we started talking to just before the pandemic. Um, and one of the things that became evident was that that particular client uh, had six divisions in the UK. They each ordered um, parts from vendors in Taiwan. Um, but what they didn't have visibility of was the fact that the guy in Durham was ordering the same parts as the guy in Gloucester. They were being ordered from the same supplier at the same time, they were moving in the same truck on the same ship in the same container and being delivered here in the same van. And yet they were being charged for two separate orders. They were having to spend money on minimum order quantities out of that supplier because neither were talking to each other. So what we gave them was visibility of what 
they were doing as a, as a whole and gave them uh, the ability to consolidate those orders together, which optimized their spend, reduced their cash to cash cycle uh, and, and took away a lot of the shipping costs because they weren't paying multiple times. And that was a saving of £300,000 over a year just by doing that. Now, that was a conversation that they probably wouldn't have been open to before the pandemic when they didn't need to. There was no gun to their head. So I guess my advice would be don't assume that your supply chain is fit for purpose. Things are changing all the time. New processes, new services, new solutions, et cetera. Um, so do engage with your freight forwarder and, and actually open the door to them as opposed to simply say, send me your rates because, you know, price is not uh, the, 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 the one and only uh, priority these days. It's future proofing your supply chain, making sure it's fit for purpose today uh, with an eye on ESG. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Um, I have another question here. Um, probably one I can probably answer, but I'll get your feedback as well, Richard. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any trends or shifts with INCO terms within certain supply chains? Um, from my experience, obviously, since we've left the EU, um, there seem to be a lot of companies that still want to use XWorks and DDP. Um, we always advise people to you know, try not to use X works, um, try to use FCA. Um, some people, a lot of people sort of still think they can use X works, but, uh, you know, they, they don't understand that um, there's, there's not as much control over, you know, providing proof of export when obviously prior to, prior to us being in the EU, it was very easy to sort of, sell your product and, and leave it on the shelf ready for your, your freight forwarder to come across from the EU and collect. But obviously now we've got uh, a lot more issues and there needs to be someone that, uh, you know, does the export entry and you need to have proof of, of, this, of the, the VAT that's been zero rated at export. Mm -hmm. So people are getting a little bit stung on that one. So we always try and uh, give advice to, to our customers to, to use uh, FCA. So at least they're in control of their export entry. Um, and if not, obviously, use similar INCO terms, you know, or try and use DAP. Uh, similar, similar, uh, similar to that, um, some, some customers uh, are still using DDP as well, and they're still, we, we get the odd um, question that's raised why people are being invoiced for the VAT and duty uh, at the other end. Uh, it's because they've probably used DDP before, you know, especially before we... Uh, before we left, before we left the EU, um, but in certain cases, there are um, European companies that don't want to be an importer of record, and so the, and on those circumstances, there is there is a use for DDP, um, but it does get a little bit complicated because obviously then you need to have uh, some form of uh, importer of record their end or an indirect representative. Um, so, uh, Richard, I don't know what your view on that would be i agree i think um you know before shipping something from luton to uh edinburgh um doesn't need any paperwork and shipping from luton to milan didn't need any paperwork um it was it was a domestic move as soon as those rules changed um everybody should have looked at their INCO terms and re realized that we can't just send on, on either XWorks or DDP basis anymore because it, it opens up all kinds of liabilities. So um, what we're seeing more and more is um, uh, UK companies uh, shipping on a DAP basis. So all of the customs uh, at, at destination is down to the, the end customer, which of course the end customer isn't necessarily always happy about, but it means that then you're not liable for, for the clearance and, um, uh, duties and taxes when it when it gets to Italy or Spain or wherever. Oh, thank you for that. Here's, here's a, a, a more of a freight forwarder related question um, that you probably uh, how how are freight forwarders and customs brokers adapting to the changes in the market with twice as many entries and a shortage of clearance cl um, clerks? This is, yeah. always, this is always a good one for you guys to answer. Um, 
it, it's it's a struggle. We knew it would be. I mean, essentially, what we did as a country was was double the number of customs entries overnight uh, when we left the EU. Um, uh, so having that expertise, um, uh, uh, there was no tap. Um, I remember at one of the Brexit events, um, somebody met me at the coffee table afterwards and, and said, I think you've been a little bit, um, a little bit of a doom monger there, a bit of a, a you know, project fear. Uh, and he said, you know, I remember before the borders came down and um, uh, we used to clear goods coming in from Europe without a problem. And at that point, there were 80 companies at Dover alone just doing customs clearances. At the time of Brexit, there were four. So we dismantled all of that infrastructure. Uh, we reduced the number of customs officers anyway at ports. And all of a sudden, we had to double everything. So for us to find that expertise in, as an industry, not just to scan global, but as an industry, has been extremely tough. There's been a lot of in-house training. Coupled with that, we had CDS coming in, so a completely new system. And it remains a challenge. Um, getting good people anyway in, you know, in, the, in today's climate is, is, is very difficult. Um, but getting anybody with customs expertise uh, is, is particularly uh, difficult. So they, and, and, and the cost for those people goes up, which is why Rob lives in Shanghai, New York, Milan, and he's got a place in, uh, in Monaco as well, because um, people with his expertise are very difficult to find. Excellent. Um, I have, have one more question. Uh, what makes a successful and sustainable supply chain? What's your, uh, what's your views on that one? Um, well, referring to, the, to, to, to what we talked about with ESG, um, I, I, don't, I, I, I think there are a lot of ways of, of considering your supply chain in a different way, as I referred to earlier. Do talk to somebody within your, your logistics partner, your freight forwarder, um, who, who does understand that. So what we've done for a lot of customers is... Um, looked at uh, their, their sort of supply chain in, in the sense that why are you holding so much stock here? Why are you bringing it all in by air? What's your turn time? Um, how much of that could you hold in China? How much of that could you put on a, on a ship? The, the CO2 impact of an air freight shipment per kilo is 100 times greater than it is on an ocean freight vessel. So the more you can move by ocean, the better. Um, in terms of your CO2 impact. Um, but I do think this is a time to put a mirror up against you, yourselves on, on your supply chain and take a, a real blank piece of paper to it and allow maybe someone from outside to use best practice to, to look at it. And, um, you know, there are still companies we come across who say, we've always done it this way. And, uh, it, it, you know, there's always opportunities to, 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 to improve it to reduce your spend, number one, but also to make you more more uh, more uh, uh, sustainable. Yeah, brilliant. No, I totally agree. Um, okay. Um, are, are there any more questions from from the uh, the guys out there? Um, don't, don't forget to use the the, the Q and A facility. No, sort of hang on for two seconds just in case any more questions want to come in. Um, in the meantime, um, sort of maybe linking back to obviously to, to improving supply chains, uh, I'd like to make make people aware of our, our, our future trade workshops and, and what we do. Um, uh, some of the some of the future trade workshops coming up that will obviously make you more aware of. of of some of the areas where you could probably improve your supply chain and your knowledge. Uh, we've got some um, introduction to customs declarations course coming up on the 7th of June, which is always extremely beneficial, um, especially with the new changes. Uh, one of my favorite courses is understanding commodity codes. A lot of people that are sort of new to exporting uh, and want to understand sort of the, the, the details of, of how, how commodity codes work uh, and, and the breakdown of, you know, of the information for importing and, and the information on on exporting 
Um, that's, that's a great course. Uh, that's coming up on the 14th of June. Um, another great one, which, uh, which includes uh, rules of origin, which is, is always our, one of our favorite subjects here at the Chamber. Um, we've got a course on customs procedures and documentation, including rules of origin on the 20th of June. So, um, and of course, we offer a customs advice and support helpline. Uh, please visit uh, our website um, for, if you want details on our, our, our bronze, silver and gold packages, or, or simply email our trade uh, email address, which is, which is shown there as well. Um, I think that uh, without any more questions, that kind of brings us to the end. Um, you know, obviously, please get in contact if, if you've got any more questions uh, later on, and we'll endeavour to sort of answer uh, answer them at a later date. Uh, Richard, was there anything else from you? No, just thanks for everybody for for uh, uh, listening, and, and hopefully there was some value in it for you. Um, and obviously, we'd be very happy to talk to anybody about any of the, the matters we discussed, or or to to uh, see if we can help uh, ready your supply chain for the upcoming ESG regulations and uh, give any advice on the, the upcoming customs uh, changes. Uh, brilliant. Rob, anything else from you <laughs> over there in, in Shanghai? No, no, it was great. No, thanks very much. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you both. Uh, it's, been, it's been a great, uh, great bit of information and hopefully it's helped other people as well. And um, on the back of that, obviously, we, we in the chamber are here to help as well. So um, thank, thank you all. Thank you all for attending. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thanks.